Well, we are concluding a mini-series today called Upwards, Onwards, and Outwards. And we've been looking at the book of Joshua, been looking at some of the uh, stories of Joshua leading the people of God into a place of promise and seeing the miraculous provision of the Lord along that journey. And I would like you to turn with me, if you've got a Bible, or if not, it will be on the screen behind us, to Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, what we're going to look at today. I'm reading for the New International Version, and it says this, When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. I want to talk this morning about getting your praise on. I want to talk about putting on your garments of praise this morning. I want to put some markers down in our lives and in our church that just identify the celebratory reasons why we can just get our praise on. If you go for walks in parks, you will often see benches that will have a little plaque on there. And on that plaque, it will have someone's name and it will say this was their favorite spot when they lived. And this is a memorial for their life. You will, um, as various parts of society, you'll see statues or memorials in various places that put a marker down that something significant or something of a legacy was left by this individual. And here we have a story where God did something amazing. You remember last week we looked at the Jordan was in complete flood at this time. This was at its highest point. It, the flood was at its highest when it was harvest season. And we looked at last week that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard and he will make a way through for his light to shine and for his goodness to be revealed. And here we have the second part of that story where it wasn't just God's promise that he would do that, but this was them emerging on the other side of the flooded Jordan with dry feet. Isn't that amazing? That, can you imagine of being there at that moment? Can you imagine if I said, okay, guys, this morning, um, just got a word from God. We're, we're just, instead of having a sermon, we're going to go and walk down to the River X. And I, I know it looks a bit scary. I know that someone like Dave would be thinking, oh, great, get me in there. The, the faster the flow, the better. But most of us would think this is, too, this is too much of a torrent for us to cross. And I said, it's okay, guys, because um, the worship band are going to take their electric guitar in the water. And... <laughs> And it's not going to be a problem, and the water is just going to stop upstream. Don't need to take your shoes off, keep your socks on. Don't need to wear your waterproofs. We're going to get through to the other side, and your feet are going to be dry. Well, that would be quite an interesting start of the morning, wouldn't it? I know some of you would say, why don't we just go across the bridge? But there wasn't a bridge. There wasn't a bridge. And we get to the other side, and it's just like everybody's celebrating. But the thing was that there was a reason why they were crossing the water. Because they were heading towards a place of promise. But they knew that as wonderful a miracle that was that they just experienced, that they were going to need bigger miracles. Because there was someone else living in the promised land. That were more skilled as a fighting force than the Israelites were. That they... Uh, that it's often easier to defend because they had put a lot of investment into defending this promised land with big fortified walls. And they knew that, the Israelites knew that. 
And so when they got across this miracle and the waters parted and they got to the other side, there would have both been a wonder and an amazement at what God had just done. But immediately there would have been a thought, we've got more battles. We've got more things. Where are we going to camp tonight? What are we going to do this evening? We need to prepare our weapons for war. There would have been all these dilemmas and perplexing thoughts about what was ahead of them. Because now they were closer to the trouble than they were previously. They were closer to the enemy than they were before the miracle happened. And it would have been quite a natural thing for them to be thinking, what next? But God gave Joshua an instruction. He said, you may be tempted, and I'm paraphrasing here what God was doing and his reasoning, but you have just experienced a miracle and you're going to experience many more, but I want you to mark this moment. I want you to restrain your mind from just now racing ahead to the next thing, and I want you to mark this miracle in your life. See, often we understand that our relationship with God is often involving us creating lists of things to pray for. You get that. We've done it this morning. We've brought some needs before him and said, God, we need your intervention and your input on these things. Would you miraculously intervene? Would you cause the water to stack up? Would you cause us to walk through this on dry ground? We know that our life with God involves that. And it's almost like we've got a notice board in our life that we keep pinning our prayer requests on. Do you have one of those? And we get our post-it notes and we write down our needs and we pin them on the board and we say, God, this is our prayer board. We're going to have faith we're going to trust you. We're going to keep bringing these before you. We are going to persist in prayer until we see these things answered. But there's another board that should be in our lives. There's a prayer board and there's a praise board. And the thing is, we all find it really tempting that when we cross through when we take one of those prayer items off the board because it's wonderfully been answered, we then think one down, nine to go. And there's another board. That issue that was attached to the prayer board is not meant to be scrumpled up and put in the bin. It's meant to be transferred to the praise board. It's meant to be carried over and our lives will always have needs. We'll always have issues that we're pinning to the prayer board. But we should be building an extension on our praise board because there are so many that have now transferred. But the temptation for us is to scrumple it and throw it and say, been there, done that. And God said to Joshua, no, no, no. Joshua, this is not a moment just to move on from. This is a moment to remember for generations to come. You see, honoring what God has done in the past is really important. I was never very good at history in school. I, I just couldn't understand the relevance of why Learning about the Battle of Hastings made any significance to my life today. And I was very pragmatic. I wanted to know what will help me now and what will make a difference to my future. And I couldn't quite get how understanding those things would help me. But you know, as I've matured a little bit, I'm still very young, but as I've matured a little bit in my youth, I'm beginning to think and understand an appreciation for past things that have happened. I've been reading about this city. I've been exploring some of the foundations and some of the interesting things that have happened in this city. And it's really helpful to know and to understand 
some of the things that have gone before us. It's helpful. It gives a context. It teaches some lessons that we learn. And God's Word is, a, is full of praise board issues for us. Of past generations that have experienced the things of God. And we're not meant to look and say, good for them. But we're meant to look and say, God, if you can do that for them, you can do it for me. If you can break out in power in other nations, like in Indonesia right now, there is a phenomenal move of the Spirit. You, there may be some headlines in the press. I know there were some headlines yesterday in some of the press about the Church of England having to rationalize resources. I want you to know that there are some phenomenal Church of England churches that are growing and thriving and moving in the things of God. And there's some revolutions taking place. It's wonderful. But I know that people say when you look at the statistics of church attendance in the UK, it has been declining for a number of years. But when you look at the statistics from across the globe, the church is growing. The church is expanding. And incidentally, in many parts of this nation, there are thriving, growing churches. In fact, do you know last week, we hit what we think was a record attendance here in this church last Sunday. You know, the church of Jesus Christ is growing. It's advancing. God has promised that he will build his church. In Indonesia, there are Muslims that are having dreams in the night. That Jesus is introducing himself to them. And they are giving their lives to Christ. Do you know, they haven't planted congregations and churches in many places. They've put prayer towers. And they're praying for their cities and their communities. And Muslims are having dreams. And they're running to the prayer towers and giving their lives to Christ. In South America, there are phenomenal things taking place in South America. The church of Jesus Christ is thriving and growing. Got a friend of mine who goes over to China teaching leaders in churches over there. And he said to them a few years ago, he said, I often hear about the persecution that you're experiencing. And we've been praying that it would stop. And they said, oh, don't do that. We're afraid that if the persecution stops, we'll become nominal Christians. The persecution keeps us sharp. And when you read and hear the stories of people who are thriving in their faith in spite of the river being in flood, and how God is making a way, and they're coming through the other side strong and victorious in the Lord. It builds your faith. Why? Because it's on the praise board. And in your life, there may be some things you need to pull out of the recycle bin. There may be some things you need to take out and dig out and you need to unscrumple and stick them on the praise board because our praise so often seems to be so dependent on our feelings of the moment and that's not what God designed. And God said to Joshua, this is to be a memorial of my miracle among you for generations to come. When your kids ask, tell them what these stones mean. Do you know, there should be people looking at my life and your life and saying, what is that? Why do you do that? And we say, ah, oh, that's a miracle God did in my life. There should be some things that stand out. But it takes discipline to do that. It takes discipline to praise. Because, you know, if I was these guys, I'm thinking, I, I want to go on to the next battle now. Come on, we're on a winning streak. Let's go for this. And God said, go back yeah. into the riverbed. Thinking, oh no, what if, I, I could believe we could walk across, but do I really have to go back in there? All this water is increasing in the distance. Because the river didn't stop, it just stacked up. And so there's more water stacked upstream. Do I really have to go back in and grab those stones and make the memorial? God says, absolutely. Get your praise on. You see, God has called us to have a life of praise where we have a praise board in our lives. Our praise, and I'm not just going to talk about a Sunday, but I will use this as an illustration. Because I don't believe we come together to worship. I believe we're worshipers coming together. I don't believe we come 
to, in, to just encounter God, I believe we come together to encounter God. Because we can encounter God every day of our week. We can worship Him every day of our week, anywhere, anytime, any place. And that's our life of worship. But let's talk about when we come together. If you needed to be persuaded this morning that God is good and you should praise Him, something is missing in your life. You should have enough on your praise board to make an overwhelming case as to why you should have been giving God everything this morning. Maybe you have one and you didn't read it. Do not, do not come together without reading your praise board. Let's not expect someone at the front to say, let me give you three reasons why God is good this morning. Come on, let it resound from the congregation. Let it resound from the people of God that just we explode with praise because we are all aware that there's so much on this praise board in our lives now. Amen. And okay, there are things on the prayer board, but our praise gives us context and perspective that sees the prayer board as a place that God can invade. If we go straight to the prayer board and don't have the praise board, our Christian walk is lopsided. Praise is a lifestyle, not just an activity. But if we read on, it's, um, there's a lot of tough verses in the Bible, isn't there? And uh, this is one that brings a little bit of um, sympathy for those in the story. If you turn to chap chapter 5 and verse 8, it says this, And after the whole nation had been circumcised... Ouch. <laughs> they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. See, in the wilderness, there had been certain things that God had given the Israelite community previous that they were to do. That circumcision was, a, was a, an outward sign of a, of a in a heart condition that they were pruned and devoted and dedicated to the Lord and so God set this culture and set this mandate on the Israelite nation that they were to do an outward demonstration of an inner truth and that was circumcision but during the wandering years in the wilderness this had ceased to happen and because there were greater miracles to come, God reminded Joshua that this community were to be a devoted community, were to be a community whose hearts were devoted to the Lord, and there needed to be a restoration of this outward sign of circumcision. And so this physical act that the men would have experienced was going to be something that would involve some sacrifice and some pain. Because we read that they needed to heal up after this. Now, I'm, I'm so glad that Paul clarified later in the New Testament <laughs> that, uh, you know, there are certain outward expressions that don't have to be done in order to validate our faith. Men, let's give thanks to God right now. <laughs> Praise God for New Testament. But you know, there are times when our praise, when our devotion, when our worship involves great sacrifice that isn't easy. It isn't straightforward. It isn't without cost. In fact, 2 Samuel 24, verse 24 says this, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. There's too much loose change praise that goes on in the church of Jesus Christ. There's too much of, what have I God, that I don't need, that I can give. 
And we see a whole community here. Costly giving. Sacrificially giving. And there can be various ways that we sacrifice in our worship and our devotion to the Lord. We can sacrifice our songs. You know, a number of years ago, and you probably will never get a copy of this, um, Nita and I made an album. And um, it's on display in the Natural History Museum in London. Um, the spare copies are in the lock and key that rarely get um, given to people these days. But we made an album, and when I look back at how that album was formed, we were going through some of the most difficult times in our life. I had been, I'd acquired a piano, an electric piano that had been rescued from a, from a skip. We had no money, couldn't afford a piano for our home. And there was one that had caught fire and been thrown into a skip. And I rescued it. So there I am with a, a part fire damaged piano. There I am, Anita, going through some really tough things in our life. We'd lost a baby. We were experiencing some real challenges in our ministry and in our life. It was really dark and it was really hard. And I sat by that burnt piano. And I just wrote songs of sacrifice. Some of them were songs that I think if the, if the piano had still been on fire, my tears would have put them out. It was a time of sacrifice in a song before the Lord. You know, some of, those, some of those songs have been sung in other places. Some of them have been recorded by other artists. But most of them, nothing much has happened with them. But they were my song before the Lord. I want to encourage you. You may be tone deaf. But why don't you write some songs before the Lord? I used to get people come to me when I was a worship pastor in one church. And they would say, Mark, I've got a song. I've got a song that I've written. And I've got to be honest, there was a time when I used to dread that because I used to think, oh no, the pressure is going to be on us to sing this song now. I remember one guy bringing me a song that he'd written and the words were meant to say, our God is larger, but he'd written the word lager. <laughs> Just had visions of perplexed Pentecostals staring at the acetates. Do you remember the acetates? Always going upside down or sideways. Oh, I miss those fun days. Our media team are far too good. We always get the words on right. And where's the fun in that? Come on, give us some wrong words sometimes. <laughs> There's a vision of Pentecost. Our God is lager. <laughs> and I used to dread people bringing me songs. But do you know then I began to um, understand something. That the Lord says... Sing a new song to the Lord. And we've become so dependent on other people writing those songs now. And there are so many of them. There are albums coming out from all over the world that are phenomenally brilliant. Better produced than they've ever been. Great songs, great prophetic edge. Spirits saying great things to them. And thank God for those. Thank God for our own worship teams. And I, and I, and I just believe that our worship teams will be writing more and more songs in the future. That will capture what God's doing in the house here. And maybe some of your songs will be a part of that. But I want you to know that's not the winner of a song. Because the most significant audience you can ever have is the audience of the one. And I used to say to some people when they brought songs, they would say, before you show me the song, I want you to know this. There are some songs that God gives that travel the world and they bless the church. There are other songs that they just see the light of day in their church and they bless the church. But then there are other songs that bless your heavenly Father. And that's the benchmark. Because other people, they don't necessarily know if you've just gone through some 
Christianese definitions and stock phrases that you've cut and pasted onto a song that has a good rhythm and has a good feel. But they don't know whether it's sincere and from the heart, but God does. And even if you feel your musical ability is burnt out, even if you feel it's non-existent, why don't you think about writing the Lord a song? The Bible says he even gives a song in the night, in the dark hours. Though sorrow may last for a night, and that's when the Lord often gives songs. Joy comes in the morning, and that's when we sing it with the birds of the morning, and we find freedom. I believe we can have a sacrifice of song, but I believe our sacrifice is far more than musicality. We can have a sacrifice of attitude. You know, getting our praise on in our lives, it's, the scripture says, put on your garments of praise. When you woke up this morning, you looked in your wardrobe and you chose what you're wearing today. And can I just confirm and say, you all made the right choice. <laughs> Except for one person. No, I'm only joking. You, you, I'm only joking, honestly. You all made the right choice. And you had a decision to make. You know, for the guys, it was which of my two pair of jeans do I wear today? For the ladies, it was, I'm going to try these 10 dresses on and see which one I think works. You had a process of decision to make as to what you adorn your physical self with today. Where well, the scripture encourages us to put on our garments of praise. When you get up in the morning, you have a choice about what you wear. You have a choice about whether you have an attitude of praise or whether you put some sweaty cynical jacket on. And you know, you may be familiar with a sweaty, cynical jacket, but I need to tell you this. It stinks. And it doesn't suit you. You're far better than that jacket. Take it off. You know, sometimes we approach Christianity like as if God is some deodorant that disguises our stench. A quick squirt, squirt of our worship in the morning and hopefully it will mask over our cynical nature. That's not what Christianity is about. God wants you to take off the jacket of cynicism, the jacket of heaviness, and he wants you to put on a garment of praise. We should be different to everybody else in our workplace. Everyone else in our community who doesn't know the Lord should look and see there's something different about the attitude of those people. And they may look and think, what's that stone in your life? What's that fresh aroma? You say, that's my garment of praise. God is good. And you see, so often that cynical jacket happens when we just have a prayer notice board and not a praise one. God wants us to have a sacrifice of attitude, maybe a sacrifice of our time, a sacrifice of our talent, and we give it to the Lord as an act of praise and worship. When I was... When I was a teenager, just a few years ago, <laughs> I was, as a 14, 15 year old in the church I grew up in, I, I was one of the musicians. I was in the worship team. So glad they encouraged me and, and you know, fueled that love of expression in music. We, we need to encourage our young people and our, and our kids. I'm so grateful to God for them. Because so much of what we're talking about here is about actually creating a legacy that passes on to next generations. In fact, the Israelites were rebuked at one point, we read, because they weren't passing on the things that God had done in the past. And I'm glad that I was in an environment that had things passed on. 
And I became one of the main musicians as a young lad. And I remember one day, I think I was doing my paper round actually, one morning. And just I'd often use that as a time of just trying to talk to God. Don't underestimate the sort of relationship that young people can have with God. And I remember just feeling really challenged by God to lay down playing any instrument for six months. God, why would you do that? I, you know, you give me the ability to do this. Why would you ask me to lay it down? I was really challenged. I wrestled with it. And I dropped you on the floor. <laughs> I was really challenged by what God was saying. Thought maybe it was just a little bit of delirium for delivering papers in wet, soggy whales. But I really felt God work it through in my life. So, so with God, if that's what you want, that's what I'll do. So for six months, I didn't touch an instrument. It was really awkward because people don't often get those things, do they? I had people in the church saying, we haven't got a musician today, Mark. Will you play? And I look and I say, I can't. And they say, you can. I say, I can't. They said, we know you can. And I say, I know I can't. <laughs> People didn't always understand. But I knew God did. Do you know, I don't know if I got that right or not, but I know this, that I did what I believe God wanted. And I may have been naive and I may have been uh, um, delusional. I don't know. But I do believe God smiled. Yeah, yeah, that's right. so he received it as worship. Right. Sometimes sacrificing our talent is not just using it. Sometimes it's being prepared to lay it down before the Lord. But there is the ability to use it for the Lord as well. Some people, they need to bring it out from under a, a hidden place and bring it into an open place in order to use for the Lord's glory. But finally, so... There's a life of praise, there's a sacrifice of praise, but there's a third thing. And I'd like you to turn to Joshua 6, verse 3 to 5, and it says this, it'll be on the screen as well. So now we come into the moment where they get to the walls of Jericho. You all know the story. And it says this, verse 3 of chapter 6. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark on the seventh day march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets have the whole army give a loud shout then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up and everyone straight in also praise is a weapon you know there are times in life we've got to praise our way out of a situation yeah. Not just reserve it for when it happens, but to praise our way through something before we even get to the miracle. The singers and the musicians went ahead of their army. They, they're, not the, you know, they're not the scariest sort of people, really. When you've got the opponents watching over the wall what this Israelite nation are doing, and you tend to put your best up front and we got people carrying trumpets <laughs> what are they doing they've got a ram's horn I heard them rehearsing earlier on they weren't even very good and they're looking down from the wall the, op the opposition saying what are they doing but they were follow, following an instruction 
that praise goes ahead of the victory. And in our lives, when we're faced with challenge, when we're faced with opposition, there are times we come on our face before the Lord and we pray our way through, but there are also involved in that a need for us to get on our feet and to praise our way through. To get our praise on in our need. To stand with courage and say, do you know what? My God is greater. My God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. That'd make a great song, wouldn't it? (laughs) And they did it every day. It was symbolic that they were keeping God at the front. And by keeping God at the front, they kept their eyes focused on God who was at the front. So often the temptation when we face adversity in life is to panic. It's to look around and scramble around and say, how are we going to get out of this? And you look to the front and you see praise. And you say, that is my hope. God is my hope. I'm going to praise you, God. Hallelujah. I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to lift up your name. God, there is no one like you. And the enemy presses in and you say, but my God is greater. His name is higher than any other name. See, the alternative is that we put on that sweaty, cynical jacket. We have our big list of prayer needs. We squirt some spiritual deodorant. And we walk through life like this. And God's not called you to walk through life like this. God's called you to walk through life like this. Courageous, bold, victorious, strong, rising up in the vision that God's placed in your life. Why? Because God is able. And you can praise Him. Get your praise on. Make sure God's in front. By placing God at the front, it enabled him to have the space to do what he wanted to do. See, I think if they'd sent their best fighting men to the front, I think there may have been a temptation to find another way through this. I think they would have been trying to find some places in the wall that they could climb up. There would have been calculating the measurements of how they fire their arrows or whatever else they were using as weaponry over the wall. But by putting praise at the front, they were giving space for God to do a miracle. Praise in your life gives God space. I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes. And I want you to ask the question this morning, have I got my praise on? And I don't just want to ask you to reflect on that about this moment, about this day. But I want you to seriously explore whether in your life the attire that you clothe yourself in is a praise attire. And if it isn't, I want to encourage you to lift off those sweaty rags, to stop squirting that temporary mask, the muskiness deodorant, and to take hold of that garment of praise that the Lord has provided you with and to place it on you. Praise looks good on you. It suits you.